Now, thankfully, I can stop talking. Uh, we're going to invite up our good, good friend, Joe D'Amato, who's going to kick off our event. Um, we'll give him a round of applause while he comes up. So Joe submitted a talk last year. We had this idea to create this conference to talk about infrastructure. And he was one of the first people to submit of his talk was, infrastructure as code might literally be impossible. And I thought, okay, well, we're not off to a good start uh, since we're trying to have an infrastructure as code conference. Um, it was a very engaging and entertaining conversation. He didn't have enough time to finish telling his stories, so we're gonna give him more time to tell those stories today. Uh, I think the man needs almost no introduction to all of you here. Um, we're, we're very fond of his works. So we'll, we'll look forward to Joe's talk. One last thing before we start, how about a round of applause for our sponsors without whom this would not be possible. I'm not gonna name them all off. They're gonna get a chance to introduce themselves. We'll talk about them as we go for the next few days. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop talking. Welcome, Joe. Do you want this mic? I'll just use this all one, right. I guess. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Greetings. This talk is called Infrastructure as Code Might Be Literally Impossible Part Two. Um, if you're wondering what happened to part one, uh, that was last year. Uh, it's online, you can look at the video and the slides if you like. The link is just bit.ly slash impossible dash infra. <clears throat> so hi, I'm Joe. I like computers. And I once had a blog called timetobleed.com. Um, maybe some of you have heard of it before. Potentially have copied and pasted patches off of my blog straight into your production web servers. Um, if you won't tell, I won't, it's fine. Um, on Twitter, I'm just Joe D'Amato. And I'm the uh, CEO and founder of probably the greatest software company in the history of the world. It's called Package Cloud. <laughs> uh, and what Package Cloud does is it makes it really easy to create and manage repositories of Debian, RPM, RubyGem, Python, and Java packages. And we provide a lot of really, really dope features that um, are just impossible or you know, uh, non-existent on other providers or on open source projects. Um, our service is really dope. We have sort of a cloud-based SaaS service and an on-premise service. We support everything from IPv6 to CDNs. Um, our service is really, really dope. You should check it out. If you want to follow along with this uh, talk, um, you can just go to our blog. The slides are up right now. The blog is just blog.packagecloud.io. <clears throat> so anyway, hi. <clears throat> I should start this talk with a disclaimer, um, and my disclaimer today is that, uh, you know, I was asked to, um, you know, speak uh, in this sort of like longer keynote slot, which I'm very honored to do, and the interesting thing about keynotes is like I've been to a bunch of tech conferences before, and pretty much like every keynote is like this like really like well thought out, um, like deep, um, you know, like conversation about like some philosophical things about software engineering or infrastructure or whatever, and usually keynotes present like like really full, like forward-looking, like futuristic views of what the world is going to be like once we all change like a few things about our, our development practices or we use a different programming language or whatever. <clears throat> and in contrast to that, my talk today is actually more of um, a horror show. Um, and on this, on this horror show, I hope that you will join me on this, uh, this very slow-moving train ride through a place that uh, I like to exist in year-round. Um, and this place is called Tire Fire Valley. In Tire Fire Valley, we have, you know, just the best tires and the best fires. Um, anyway, infrastructure as code might be impossible because nothing works. So anyone in this room who's an infrastructure engineer or has worked in operations or whatever has been faced with tools that just don't really work. Um, and what I mean by that is tools that are buggy, tools that are broken, tools that don't work in the way you expect them to work in the ways in which the documentation tells you they will work. Um, and are just unfinished, um, kind of like this house without a ceiling. Um, you don't always have like all the pieces to the puzzle that you need to actually do what you're trying to do on a, on a daily basis. And I think that like the existence of, you know, sort of broken tools and like lack of documentation or unfinished tools and whatnot adds to something that I spoke a lot about last year called um, cognitive load, basically the amount of energy and time you have to spend thinking about stuff um, day to day just to get your job done. And um, last year I sort of posited that the more tools that are broken or don't work well, uh, the more cognitive load you have, and the more cognitive load there is, makes it more difficult to get your job done because there's just 
so much software you have to understand and, and know how to use and configure and deploy and maintain. And um, last year my argument was essentially that as we sort of use uh, more um, complicated <clears throat> deployment and automation systems like Chef or Puppet or whatever on top of that, we sort of add more code um, to sort of the most difficult part of the, of the stack, right? Like we have like these applications that are hard to understand how to use and how to monitor and how to run properly. Then we add like more code on top of that that's like also hard to understand how to use properly. Um, and it just becomes like more and more difficult to actually get stuff done, at least in my opinion. Um, and this sort of, uh, I think could be highlighted by this idea that there's just too much stuff. Like the average dev or ops person has to know like so much stuff now to get their job done. Um, I think it's pretty incredible like just the amount of knowledge you have to have experience in to just work in, in a tech company these days. And I think that like because of that, that's sort of given rise to like a bunch of coping strategies. Um, and I think this is sort of like a natural reaction for human beings. When humans are confronted with things that are like really complicated, people sort of develop coping strategies. And some coping strategies that I think have been developed as a result of this are pretty interesting. There's um, sort of stack overflow, which is pretty big now, right? People will copy and paste sort of like the answers like directly off of Stack Overflow, like into their terminal and like deploy it. And there's also like copy and paste configurations that people sort of yank off of Stack Overflow too. And I think that this, like I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? Like I think that that's just sort of like, you know, uh, par for the course because of all the work that we all have to do every day. That's um, like really difficult and like, you know, there's, there's just too many things to understand that there's no way you can be expected to understand how every single like individual piece of the system that you're supposed to run works and so it makes sense that people are going to build websites where you can search for a configuration file that you can copy and paste and just peel out. I mean by the way this idea that like what we do is really really difficult and takes a lot of time and it's hard to do well is actually part of another talk that I'm working on and that talk is called programmers should get paid more and work less. <clears throat> um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, so I think that this problem with like broken tools and like the increasing cognitive load is so pronounced that in some cases it's actually impossible to do seemingly simple tasks. So some examples of like what tasks I'm talking about then some thoughts at the end. So today's cool stories, I'm going to talk about um, some, a bug, an interesting bug in SSL, some bug in apt, a uh, Linux networking bug and then hopefully there's time there's this like really, really interesting Linux threading bug that took place, it was sort of like a slow moving uh, collision that took place over seven years. So I'm going to show like a piece of code that went in at one point in 2001 that was then fixed in 2008 and it was also the, re it was like basically the X-Free 86 window manager didn't work properly and that resulted in threads being completely broken on Linux for seven years. Um, so that's like a pretty interesting train wreck to watch and then if there's time, which there probably won't be, I'll talk about some Python packaging stuff. So cool, let's get the horror show started, shall we? Um, SSL, so I'm going to start out by making a bold claim. SSL is important and it's literally in bold. Um, <laughs> I don't know like, you know, if anyone disagrees with me, I mean, probably most people would agree that SSL is important, right? I don't know. Um, if you don't agree that SSL is important, you'd be in good, you'd be in pretty good company because um, Ubuntu and Debian also don't agree that SSL is important. <laughs> and the reason that I know they don't agree that SSL is important is because SSL doesn't work on Debian and Ubuntu. <clears throat> And how do I know that? Well, there's this really cool bug report that I want to show you all. Uh, this bug report is uh, GNUTLS receive error. Uh, actually, so bef before I go into this bug, like the thing about the thing about GNUTLS, I don't know how many of you have used it or have seen it or whatever. This project, like, just the the name of this project, like, really eats away at my soul um, because it's it's spelled GNUTLS, but it's supposed to be pronounced noodles, um, and. <laughs> It just like really annoys me that that's the way you pronounce this project. Like the first thing I think of when I think of someone showing up and telling me, well actually Joe you're pronouncing the name wrong, it's noodles, is this picture. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, noodles ugh, uh, has this bug that occasionally happens pretty rarely. It's you know error negative nine, a TLS packet with unexpected length was received. And this basically just means that like randomly when you're using a project that uses noodles, you won't be able to actually receive data from the internet, which is bad. Um, probably you would be thinking at this point, like, you know, lol noodles, who cares, right? Like, no one uses noodles, like, you're stupid, stop talking. Um, and I would say that, like, actually a lot of projects on, on Debian Ubuntu use noodles, like apt-get, and it uses noodles via the apt to HTTPS transport, git, curl, ngircd, and like many others. Um, so, on a lot of systems, uh, on a lot of, you know, a lot of systems are built on sort of tools like git, curl, apt-get, and so on, and if noodles doesn't work right, then that means that like those tools also don't work right. <clears throat> so you might slide into this conversation with your Fedora on and say, well, actually, you should use OpenSSL. And, um, you know, thankfully someone thought of that and the response was, unfortunately, Git compiled with OpenSSL cannot be distributed for licensing reasons. So I wondered what that meant. Um, 
Confronted with two choices, wake up to the harsh reality of the world or just go back to sleep and pretend it didn't happen. Um, I'm the type of person that you know, likes to understand the harsh realities of the world. Um, and also, I like rabbits, so I wanted to go down the rabbit hole and see what happens. So the OpenSSL license says, all advertising materials mentioning features used in the software must display the following, blah, 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 blah. And then it also says, redistribution of any form whatsoever must retain the following, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So it's basically two things saying you have to like, retain some stuff. The GPL says, you may not impose any further restrictions on the recipient's exercise of the rights granted herein. So in other words, these two licenses are incompatible, which also means, in other words, that software licensing uh, complexities force you to use a particular SSL library with a very painful bug that prevents you from actually reading data from your network. Greetings. Um, I think this is pretty interesting because uh, it's sort of like a political, like legal problem, which we could potentially solve, but no one has solved. Um, and I'm going to show you sort of why. And, and before I get into that, right, like I'm not saying that OpenSSL is bug free, but what I'm saying is that projects like NSS or Noodles or whatever have significantly less mind share, right? Like people are finding lots of bugs in OpenSSL because there's a lot of people like actually focused on and working on OpenSSL to try to make it better. And I just think that like there's less mind share for other projects. So um, it would be really, really dope if like more projects could use OpenSSL. Um, by the way, if you want to know like how deep this rabbit hole goes with OpenSSL and Noodles on, on Debian, it's pretty interesting. Here's a, uh, just a, there's a pr uh, software project called Lynchin. I don't know like if any of you are familiar with it, but Lynchin is basically like a tool you can run to check your Debian packages. It'll tell you like, yeah, your Debian packages work really well or like, you know, they have some weird bug in them or they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing. So, and the way it works is it runs like a bunch of different rules or whatever. And one of the rules that it runs is a rule called possible GPL code linked with OpenSSL. Um, and this is like such a thing that like they actually have a rule that will run on Debian packages to figure out whether or not this is happening. And um, if you go to the page, you can see like a graph. So there's like a bunch of projects. There's, um, you know, 30, there's like 131 of them or something like that, or 161 of them that are affected. Um, and my favorite part of this page is just that it's like listing, like all these things are bad. There's like all these projects that are affected. And at the very, very bottom, there's this thing, severity, serious, certainty, wild guess. <laughs> so hi. <clears throat> um, but you may be thinking like, okay, I don't really care about, about noodles, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I hit this bug every now and then on apt, but it doesn't really matter. I can just turn off SSL. I'm going to use GPG because apt has support for GPG. Um, if you were to say that to me, I would say you should go watch my talk from last year, which basically explains how there's numerous um, sort of man in the middle attacks that package managers are vulnerable to, and you should definitely use OpenSSL. And any claim to not use OpenSSL in favor of GPG is the most boring thing I've ever heard. Um, so just don't do that. Um, anyway, um, so since we're on the subject of apt, uh, let me tell you about an interesting, another interesting apt bug. So file compression is important. Agreed? Um, so I, I don't know, maybe you can see where this is going. But um, Ubuntu and Debian don't agree that file compression is important. Um, and I know they don't agree that file compression is important because um, there's this interesting bug called apt hash sum mismatch. Um, more about what hash sum mismatch means in a bit, but first I'm going to talk about this compression bug. So the bug that was filed said something like this. It said, you know, this was a bug in the uncompression of XZ files indicated by blah, 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 blah. So what's happening is when you run apt get update or apt get install or whatever, apt is going to use, uh, you know, the LZMA library to extract a bunch of metadata so it can read it and understand what packages are available in your repository. It turns out that there's a bug in app that prevents it from extracting XZ archives properly, which means that it can't read the metadata, which means that it can't install packages, and then it dies with like a really confusing error message that says hash some mismatch. Um, so in other words, you know, app, there's an app bug when decompressing XZ files makes it literally impossible to install software reliably. And this is sort of like a really unfortunate bug, right? Because the slow release cycle of Debian and Ubuntu updates means that if someone wants to correct this bug in a version of apt, you won't get it until you upgrade your operating system, which as most people who work at like a big company know, um, you know, upgrading your operating system is like something that happens like relatively rarely. Um, but you might be thinking like, yeah, I don't really care about XZ being broken, right? Like that's super easy, uh, taking care of that. That's like the type of work that I can do over the weekend. Um, I can just do that by adding this like really long, ugly line to every single apt get command I run. Um, which like, yeah, you could do that, but um, hopefully the repository that you do that with actually has metadata that's zipped using a different compression format. Otherwise, it's going to be a real short trip. Anyway, uh, hash some mismatch. So I don't know, like, have you seen it? 
Maybe, maybe some of you have seen it, maybe you haven't. I don't know. Do you know what it means? Some people know what it means. It's sort of confusing. Do you know why it happens? I'm going to sort of explain these three things to you. So what it means, to understand what this, what this like really, really painful bug hash means, you have to understand a little bit about the way that app repositories work. And the way they work is there's, a, there's like a file, a top-level file called the release file. And uh, the way the release file works is that the release file lists other files. Um, and so you can see sort of on the bottom, there's a set of packages files, one packages file per CPU architecture supported by this repository. And on the left side, there's a bunch of checksums, and on the right side, there's a bunch of files. And so what ends up happening is, is that apps will go and download the files that are listed on the right and compare the checksum of the file they downloaded with the checksum on the left side. So if, for example, um, you know, you're unable to decompress the file with XZ, then the checksums won't match, and we get a hash sum mismatch. And so a hash sum mismatch means that the hash sum that apt has computed of the file it downloaded locally doesn't match the hash sum that's in the file like globally. And it turns out that this bug happens all the time. If you actually Google hash sum mismatch, you're going to get you know, tens of thousands of results. And if you search the Debian mailing list, you're going to get all these people complaining about like, the official mirrors uh, in Debian that don't work because of like, hash sum mismatch. So OK, so we know like, what it means when it happens, right? but how could that actually happen? How can you get into a state where the files you download uh, don't match the checksum of what they're supposed to be. And there's three different ways this, this can happen. The first way is uh, with a stale cache that exists somewhere between the client and server. Um, or it can be because of the decompression bug that I just talked about. Or it can be because of a really, really interesting race condition in apt. Um, and I'm going to show you how to avoid all three of these. So to avoid the first one, which is just like a stale cache, you can use better HTTP headers, or better yet, use SSL. Um, but then you have to deal with the noodles problem. <coughs> So yeah, good luck. And then um, to avoid number two, which is the XZ problem, uh, you can just not generate XZ archives. Um, that's honestly the easiest thing to do, and that's what we do at Package Club. We just don't generate XZ archives because they just don't work. Um, and then third is the race condition, right? Like, hmm, that's weird. Like, how could there be a race condition in apt? Like, it's a pretty important tool that people build their infrastructure on top of. Like, it should probably work, right? So I'll tell you about this really interesting apt race condition and how it works. So how the apt race condition happens. Um, step one is. First, your apt client, when you run like apt get update, will download the global release file. So as you're downloading the global release file, the person who owns the repository updates the repository by pushing new packages, and then your app client downloads the packages file. So now you have a release file before the update and a packages file from after the update, and the checksum of those things um, won't match, and we get a hash sum mismatch. And this is pretty scary, right? Like this means that there's two, th this means like two big things, right? It means that it's A, impossible to update your repository without breaking any of your clients, right? So like if you sell software or ship software to people in an app repository, it's impossible to guarantee that that repository will actually be consistent for your customers. Um, and number two is it means it's impossible to generate consistent mirrors of other repositories, which means that if you wanted to mirror, for example, the Ubuntu like global repository, um, you, you can't do that reliably. Like, if you take a snapshot, like maybe it'll work and maybe it won't, and that's like kind of scary. Um, it's it's kind of interesting that like one of the most important, um, you know, software repositories, like you know, potentially in the world, doesn't have a way of, you know, consistently and correctly taking a snapshot of its contents. Um, so this is bad, and you might say, but Joe, I've done all of these before and I've never had a problem. Um, to which I would say, Con you know, congrats, you got lucky. Um, you know, someone always wins the lottery. Today that was you. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so wait, are you saying that apt metadata is inherently racy, that the actual design and implementation of the repository at a basic level is incorrect? And the answer to that is yes. Um, and th amazingly, Ubuntu actually agrees. So here's a cool bug. It's apt repository disk format has race conditions. Um, okay, so apt repositories and the tools you, you, you use to generate them are fundamentally racy and don't actually work. So sad kitten. Oh. So now what? Well, the answer to this problem, uh, as thought of by the apt maintainers, is the addition of a new feature to apt called acquire by hash. Acquire by hash is really, really interesting. It is a mechanism for downloading metadata by its hash sum. And the way it works is that a server should keep a few older copies of the metadata around. And um, this sort of feature prevents this race condition because your apt client is going to download the file it wants by requesting it via its hash sum as opposed to the file name. That way it's always getting the thing that it expects to get and the, the hash sums will always verify. Uh, acquired by hash was added in apt 
2.0, is, which is available on Ubuntu Xenial or newer, Debian, and Debian Stretch or newer. Um, it is, this feature is actually not supported by RepRepro. It's also not supported by Apply or pretty much any other tool that I could check. There's actually only one way to get working, consistent, not racy metadata that will make your customers and your users happy, and that way is to use my software. <laughs> Um, or not, or you could just, you know, serve up broken stuff to the, the world, it's fine. I mean, you should do whatever you want, but, you know, I know what I would do. Um, anyway, uh, so on to the Linux networking bug, which is, pretty, which is pretty interesting as well. Okay, so Linux networking. Um, I did a full write-up of the Linux networking stack, and by full write-up I mean that the write-up is literally 90 pages long, and it's literally everything about Linux networking and it is literally available here, um, bit.ly slash Linux dash networking. Um, you should check it out. Um, you probably won't get to the end of it. Um, it's just really, really long. And I, I basically talk about everything from sort of like the device driver and like how, you know, PCI initialization works on a PC all the way up to, you know, uh, data getting into the receive buffer, um, you know, on the kernel side of a, of a process. So it's like literally every single moving piece. So if you're interested in like Linux networking or how to tune and optimize the stack, you can check out bit.ly slash Linux dash networking. Um, I can give you a short one slide, slum one slide summary of the way that Linux networking works, and it is like this. Um, <laughs> Linux networking is like really, really complicated, really confusing, and there's lots of moving pieces, um, which you know you probably fasten your door and slide into my conversation and say, random operating system has a better, faster, leaner, whatever networking stack than Linux, to which I would say that's definitely the most boring thing I've ever heard. Um, but the interesting thing about the Linux networking stack is that there's so much of what I was talking about earlier, like these coping mechanisms of copying and pasting. There's lots and lots of copy-paste uh, coping. And I'm going to give you a really, really cool example of this. So here's a question you can find on Stack Overflow, right, which is just like, can you please advise the best practice to tune uh, operating system for my needs? Here's my Cisco tools, right, just like dump of like the Cisco tools. And then there's an answer that was proposed, which is like, I propose using these values. Um, and it just says, yeah, test it on an Oracle database server on RHEL um, and in backup software. Just like, I don't know what that means. Like, how did these numbers come to exist? Like, no, no one even knows, right? And then you can, look at, you can look for other answers. You see similar questions and answers all around the internet. Like, here's another one, right? Cut and paste the following things into a Linux shell with root privileges. <laughs> like, I don't, like, who even, like, these values, like, these values, like, where do they come from, right? Like, um, here's, here's another answer, right? Um, just like copy and paste these things, and, and you know, it's on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And no one even knows what these values mean, right? Like, the Linux networking stack is really, really complicated. Well, pretty much no one knows what these values mean. I mean, I know what they mean, um, but most people don't. And let me, give you, let me give you a really, really dope example of this. Here's a, here's a, a Cisco tool that a lot of people have probably seen or played around with. It's called NetDev Max Backlog. So let's like look at the, at the, at the, inter, at the information on the internet about what this actually does, right? So here's one, it says, uh, NetDev max backlog is the max number of packets that can be queued for interface, for interface input if the kernel is receiving packets faster than they can be processed. And in this example, they're set to 16,384. Here's another example. Increase the number of incoming connections backlog. In this uh, example, they're set to 65,000. Here's another one. Set the maximum number of packets queued on the input side when the interface receives packets faster than the kernel can process. In this example, they're set to 5,000. Increase the length of the processor input queue. In this case, they're set to 30,000. And there's similar explanations with completely different values, but those explanations don't actually tell you what this value does, right? Like, what does it actually mean? What does NetDev max backlog actually really mean? And what does setting the value actually do? I'll tell you. If, if, if your device driver calls if your networking device driver calls net if receive skb, which is overwhelmingly likely, and if it and if it doesn't for some reason, you should definitely use a different networking device. Um, it's overwhelmingly likely that your that your driver is calling this, but you should probably check. And uh, RPS is disabled. RPS is just sort of like a load balancing mechanism for the Linux networking stack. If RPS is disabled, which it is by default, then net dev max backlog it doesn't do anything. It does nothing. It literally does nothing. It's not even checked. It's a completely separate code path. And in a lot of people's kernels, it's not even compiled in. Like, that, that value doesn't even, like, there's no code that touches it in a lot of kernels. So, cool cat says cool. <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, if your driver calls net IFRX, which is extremely unlikely that it does this, 
Um, or you're using this like load balancing thing to process packets on multiple CPUs, which is rare, but maybe you are using it. Um, then NetDev max backlog means that the data is queued um, to the CPU queue for this like distributed like load balancing network processing thing. And those queues per each CPU, each of those CPU queues is limited by NetDev max backlog. Um, and that's what it means. And it's pretty interesting to me that there is just like all these like interesting coping strategies for just like copying and pasting these Cisco tool values that get cargo culted from like blog post to blog post to Stack Overflow to Stack Overflow and like no one knows what they mean. And no one knows what they mean and in a lot of cases they don't, they don't mean or do anything, right? They're just like values that don't have, that are just, they're just pointless to set for the vast majority of people. Um, speaking of coping strategies, I think it's not just Linux networking that, that has like a bunch of interesting coping strategies. Here's a coping strategy that I think is, uh, here's a coping strategy that I think is totally fine. Um, and I'm going to warn you, it's going to make you mad. So you should start your engines, you know, fill them up with your haterade, get ready to go. Um, I think like curl to pseudo bash is completely fine. And <laughs> I can give you lots of reasons why I think it's completely fine, but like the shortest one, or the one that I can tell you the, the fastest, is that it's completely fine because you aren't reading all of your chef, your chef and puppet source anyway. So honestly, like, what's the difference? Like honestly, like what's the difference, right? Like there, there is, there is really no difference between those two things, right? You're running a bunch of software as root on your computer that you don't understand, you haven't read, and you don't know what it does. So whether it comes from a bash script or like a, or, you know, a bunch of Ruby code, like, is there any actual meaningful difference? I would, I would posit that there's not, right? Like you, you, maybe you'll use a bunch of chef modules or problem modules or whatever that you know you don't know the author, you don't know who they are, you have no idea what they've, what they've written, and you just don't have the time to sit there and read like thousands of lines of Ruby or whatever. <clears throat> excuse me, or whatever. Um, so, like, there, I just don't think there's any difference, and I think that if that upsets you, you should be mad. <clears throat> and I think that this is sort of a symptom of the larger problem, though, and the larger problem is that it's just too damn hard to understand how a computer works, right? Um, computers are really, 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 really complicated. Um, and on that note, I, I've made it to um, my, my most looking, my, the, the story that I've been looking forward to the most, which is the Linux threading story I'm gonna tell you, which is uh, an incredibly sad and interesting story. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard this meme. Uh, this is sort of like, this has been a popular meme for a while. It's starting to die out now, which is good, but the meme is like, threads are slow, which like doesn't mean anything, but like people say this. Or people also say like, context switches are expensive, or context switches are slow, or you should make sure that your apps don't context switch a lot. Um, anytime someone says this, um, I'm, I'm basically curled up like a piece of fried shrimp, just like in the corner, just like convulsing and like hallucinating or whatever. So like, please, please stop saying that, it hurts. Um, so to tell this story as to like how, like sort of the origin of this meme and like how this, how in my opinion this all got started, I first need to bring you back and reintroduce an old friend of ours, the X-Free 86 project. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I don't know like, uh, how many of you are familiar with X386, but um, just like very, very generally, it's an API, you can think of it as an API that allows window managers to interact with their computers and their, device and their graphics devices. So if you want to use something like GNOME or whatever, um, back in the day, you would use X386 to help you draw, to so help, like GNOME would use X386 to help it draw like the various aspects of the UI. Um, and in this story, I'm gonna show how a seven-year-old uh, kernel bug fix that helped to fix X386 broke threads on Linux um, over the course, like immediately, but no one noticed for seven years. And it's pretty interesting because there's like lots of these like little weird like overlapping like kernel systems that sort of like all ate each other until we got to this bug that came out a couple years later. So on that note, um, my friend Deckard Kane, greeting stranger, stay a while and listen. Okay, so I'm gonna try to explain this. Um, the thing is, is that like a lot of this information is like really, really sort of like uh, technical in, the, in like the lowest level possible. Like, like a lot of this stuff sort of pertains to like the way that the uh, Intel instruction set and the Intel architecture actually work on the processor. And I just don't have the time to explain like all of it in like complete detail. But if anyone wants to know like the gory details of any of this later, I'll be happy to talk to you like in the hallway or after the conference or, or whatever. So for now, just like, just, you know, just, just work with me on this one. All right, so there's, there's, three, there's three big pieces of the story that I need to set up for you. There's TLS, which in this instance actually means thread local storage. It has nothing to do with encryption. Um, it's just thread local storage. There's something else called segment selectors, and then there's a third thing, X386 modules. So the first two are related, thread local storage and segment selectors, and I'm gonna like briefly explain what I, like why this is important. So on Linux, um, threads are sort of, you can think of them as, as a first class citizen. And what I mean by that is that the Linux kernel knows that threads exist, which means that the kernel can schedule the threads to run on separate CPUs and they can execute in parallel. This is in contrast to other systems that don't have 
um, you know, sort of threads as a first class citizen. And it's sort of complicated why that is, but just on Linux, like the, the kernel knows that threads exist and can schedule them to run on separate CPUs at the same time. And threads have an area of memory called the thread local storage area where threads can store data that pertains to, um, you know, a particular thread that other threads won't have access to or won't see values of. And the way that like this is implemented is, is kind of tricky, right? Because if you imagine like you're an operating system, you're running software on, on a, you know, you're running a thread on a processor and it's time to like pull that, pull that thread off the processor and run something else. When you do that, you need to snapshot the thread and like save all of its state somewhere and then like restore the state of another thread that needs to run. And in order to do that, um, you need to sort of save and restore a bunch of state um, on the actual, you know, processor on the CPU itself. And um, anytime a thread is executed, you're going to want to have access to the thread local storage area. So it would be really, really dope if when you're saving and restoring the context of a thread that you could also save and restore like the address of this like thread local storage area. And the way that this is actually implemented on Linux and most operating systems is, is by misusing a register called a segment selector. So segment selectors are sort of like this old piece of like x86 from way, way back in the day. And the original intention of a segment selector is that it was used to implement a memory model called the segmented memory model. People don't really use it anymore. Right now people primarily use something called paging. Uh, and paging is sort of the most prominent memory model on Linux and Windows and other operating systems. Um, and I, I can't really get into the details of like what the exact differences are, but all you need to know is that there was a special register on the CPU that was supposed to be used for the segmented, for, for the segmented uh, memory model. Since people don't use that memory model, that register can be reused for other purposes. And the purpose that it's reused for on Linux is to store the address of the thread local storage region. So that as you move threads around, um, you can just sort of save and restore this like little piece of memory on the processor and it can be done really, really quickly. So th that's like the threading, so like just, you know, put a bow on that and like set that aside. Um, and then there's also the X386 module com component of this. X386, um, you know, the window manager, back in those days there was not really an easy way of building loadable module support for applications. And so people used to build their own loadable module systems. Um, there was no such thing really as like libdl or the runtime dynamic linker that worked as well as it does today. So people used to build their own systems to like read code off the hard drive and like map it into their process and like run, a, run that as a plugin. And the way that that was implemented was by using a system call called mmap. And what mmap does is mmap just asks the kernel to allocate a region of memory in your process's virtual address space. Um, and you can use that region of memory for anything you want. And this is actually how malloc and memory allocators work. They will grab a huge region of memory by calling mmap and then they'll carve it up and then when you call the malloc function, it'll give you a little slice of your memory out. Right? So mmap can be used for a ton of things and x386 used it back in the day to create a module loader. So a flag was added called map32bit um, and that flag was added on June 29th, 2001. And you got to remember that at this time in 2001, there really weren't, um, you know, many x86-64 uh, processors available like mainstream. Like people were working on Linux and trying to get it to run on 64-bit Intel processors, but they were doing it in, in simulators and stuff until 64-bit processors actually came out. And so they were uncovering like all these weird bugs that were happening because things weren't expecting, uh, you know, 64-bit addresses. And so on June 29th, the, the commit message that adds this, this flag to the kernel is, um, this adds a new MMAP flag to force the mappings into the low 32-bit address space. Useful e.g. for ELFs, for the x386 ELF loader or Linux threads, thread local storage data structures. And so what this means is that x386 had, it had its own modular that I just talked about, but the code in x386 expected the addresses to only be 32-bit because no one had a 64-bit processor yet and no one could imagine like what it would be like to program in that environment. Um, and similarly, because of like a really complicated intricacy of the uh, x86 architecture, the register where you store like the thread local storage uh, address is only 32, is only 32 bits also. So this flag map 32 bit was added and its purpose was so that when you could ask the kernel, hey, give me a region of memory, but I want the address of it to be, you know, 32 bits or less. That way I can fit it in this like space that can only hold 32 bits. Seems innocuous enough. On November 11th, 2002, about like a year and change later, um, a commit went into the X386, the actual program, and said, okay, fixing the module loader to map memory in the low 32-bit address space on x86-64. Um, and the important thing about this is that now this flag is actually being used outside the kernel in an actual program. Like this is like a documented use of this flag that was added to the kernel now exists in the real world, which means that it can never be removed, right? Like once it's been added and other programs are using it, it has to be there for backward compatibility. End of story. Um, and that, ha that happened on, uh, was it November 11, 2002.
So the next phase of our story takes place on January 4th, 2003. And what happens here is there's sort of two more like weird things I have to briefly mention. There's something called the ELF small code model. So when you run programs on your computer, there's different execution models that exist for different reasons. They have different trade-offs. It doesn't really matter what they are. All that matters is that there's a code model called the small code model. And in the small code model, you're required according to the spec to only allocate uh, memory regions for code uh, within 31 bits. So it can only be in the first 31 bits, the first one gigabyte of memory, right? So on January 4, 2003, a commit went into the Linux kernel that said, make, make map 32-bit uh, for 64-bit processes, only map the first 31 bits. It, uh, it is usually used to map the small code model. This fixes X server crash ups and blah, 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 blah. So what this means is that the flag is called map 32-bit, but what it's actually doing is only mapping 31-bit. So you have much less, uh, much less memory that you can map in, right? 32 bits is like about four gigabytes or so. 31-bit um, is just one gigabyte. So it's much, much less memory, but the flag was never renamed because map 32-bit was used in all these applications, so you can't rename it. It's, it's over. Um, so now the flag doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Cool cat. Um, so this is sort of like the, the train wreck is like slowly forming. We're going to get to the end here shortly. So then... <clears throat> This bug got filed uh, in February 12, 2003, and the summary of the bug was I-36 context switch is very, very slow compared to kernel 2.4 due to write MSR. Um, all you really need to know about this bug report is that um, basically as the, at the time that 64-bit processors were coming out, a bunch of features that got added to help make switching between threads um, fast and um, or to help make switching between threads easy. And there was an instruction that you need to use to, to make use of these new features that turned out to be really, really slow on uh, early 64-bit processors. And this is actually, in my opinion, sort of the origin of the threads are slow meme. It came from basically really poor performance on a single assembly instruction called write MSR way, way back in 2003 that only like very early 64-bit processors actually had problems with. Um, and so a bunch of code was added to deal with this and sort of like these two things collided like like the, the X386 bug and like the slow threading bug and like 64-bit processors like these three things sort of like all like act over each other to form like this really, really nasty bug. So on March 4th, 2003, uh, this change went into glibc and it says for Linux x86-64, we have one extra requirement. The stack must be in the first four gigabytes. Otherwise, the segment register base address is not wide enough. Um, don't really worry. I mean, all this, all this is really saying is that um, at, in, in 2003, glibc changed, and they're trying to avoid the poor performance of this instruction. And you can avoid the poor performance of this instruction if the, threads, if the address of the thread stack is less, is, is less than 32 bits. So basically, glibc was like, OK, I'm going to use map 32-bit to get a small enough address that'll fit in 32 bits. That'll allow me to avoid the use of this instruction, write MSR. And then it, switching stacks with threads will be a lot faster. So that's all this change is saying. Um, a few months later, on May, May 9, 2003, um, the justification for the use of map 32-bit in glibc changed. It said, we prefer to have the stack allocated in the low four gigabytes since this allows faster context switches which is different from the justification before, right? The justification for map 32-bit had changed from, um, you know, we're, we're required to do it because it won't fit into, this, into the segment register to we want faster context switches. These two things are unrelated, and it turns out that the faster context switches got fixed in the kernel separately. So then fast forward five years from the last change related to this. August 13th, 2008, the infamous Pardo report is filed. Uh, if you want to read the full report, you can check out the slides and go to this link. And uh, Pardo is an individual who works at Google, and they posted something on the mailing list that said, hey, MMAP is slow on MAP 32-bit allocation failure, sometimes causing pthread create to run about three orders of magnitude slower. As an example, uh, in one case, creating new threads goes from about 35,000 cycles up to 25 million cycles to create a thread, which is under 100 threads a second. So the performance uh, drastically was, was drastically affected, but why was it affected? It was affected because the folks at Google, uh, this Pardo person in particular, had filled the entire 31-bit, one gigabyte address space with thread stacks. There was no more room. And subsequent allocations for thread stacks were doing a linear search on the address space. And this linear search was causing uh, thread creation time to be super, super, super slow. And so the solution to that was to add yet another flag to MMAP. And that flag was called MapStack. And the guidance for using MapStack was basically, they added MapStack and they said to everyone, including the glibc maintainers, hey, if you want to allocate a thread stack, don't use Map32-bit anymore because it's really slow. Instead, use MapStack. 
So what does MapStack do? MapStack does nothing. It doesn't do anything. It just, it just, it's just there as like a, a placeholder in case in the future we ever need to do some like weird uh, tricks to allocate thread stacks with like better addresses. But on, on the x86 architecture, it does nothing. It's just a flag that was added that doesn't do anything. Cool. Um, and adding that flag ended up fixing the bug. Like basically that flag was added to the kernel. The glibc guys went and they changed map32bit to map stack. And that was it. And then like the problems went away and threads were fast again. But for just like a, a few years, threads were really, really slow. And they were really slow just because of a really weird bug early on with x386, with the slow, um, you know, with the slow register set, with like just all the stuff that I mentioned before. Anyway, the, the timeline of all this stuff, I, I laid it out so you can sort of see like what actually happens and when and sort of the space between them. Uh, I'm not going to go through this now, but if you look at the slides, you can sort of figure out um, sort of like when all these things happened and like happened in relation to each other. And it's pretty interesting to see the evolution of this bug from 2001 up to 2008 until it got fixed. Um, and so this sort of brings me to like a few questions about like about all this stuff, right? So a few questions. Like how did we get here? How did this happen? Um, I don't know, but I would say that um, legacy code has something to do with it. Backward compatibility has something to do with it. Um, I mean, if you look at CPU uh, instruction sets like, um, you know, the Itanium instruction set, right? Like, a lot of people like to make this like to make this claim that oh, well, if we could just wipe away all of our old, old code and start over, things will be so much better the second time around. Um, I don't know if that's true. Um, you know, the Itanium tried to do that in a lot of respects. And how many people here use Itanium? Maybe one person, maybe zero, right? Like no one uses it. Um, so there's like this really, really important need in, in our industry for backward compatibility. So we're kind of like, given the constraint of backward compatibility, we're sort of stuck with the tire fire that comes with it and there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, another thought as to how we got here. There is no such thing as free open source. Um, free open source doesn't exist. There's always some cost to using software. Um, just because you don't pay that with cash uh, you know, out of your credit card doesn't mean that it's free. It requires investment in developer time, in documentation, in understanding how to deploy and automate it, how to use it. Um, open source isn't free. Another question is like generated from all this is like, why is there so much copy and paste coping? Um, I think like the reason why there's so much copy and paste coping is just because of necessary complexity, right? Like we have systems that are complex and they're complex because our requirement, the requirements we place on them as human beings are complex. And I don't think that's necessarily bad, right? Like I, I go to a lot of conferences and I hear people talk constantly about like we need to eliminate complexity, like you don't want complex software. But like the reality is that we live in a complex world and the software we're using is really, 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 really complex. Um, and I talked about like some complexities of software in, in last year's talk. Um, there's also lack of time, right? Like the reason why like a lot of these things don't work the way they should or that there's all these like all this copying and pasting going on is just because no one has time to do anything. Um, and which sort of brings me to an aside, but like why is there no time to get anything done? Why, why do we need to resort to copy and pasting stuff off the internet? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know, but I have a theory and I, this isn't fully formed, but this is just like a seed I'm gonna plant in your minds. Um, your bosses won't like it. Could it be that efficiency gains that are made in engineering are captured by management instead of engineering? And what I mean by this is that if we build software systems like Chef or Puppet or, or whatever that make it easier for us to do our jobs uh, in less time, is it possible that instead of like reaping the benefit of that by like improving our systems, the benefit is actually being reaped by people higher up who are just shrinking the teams that are supposed to work on these things? I don't know. Um, or, could it, or, could it simply, or could it be easier than that? Could it simply be that um, working software systems just aren't economically viable for 99% of companies? Like maybe we all just need to like stop complaining about software and just like come to the understanding that none of it works and it's all gonna be terrible because it's just not economically viable to, to do it properly. And I think that that's actually like sort of evident by this, by this bug that was found by the Google people, right? Like there was this threading bug that slowed down threading in Linux by three orders of magnitude. It wasn't noticed for five years. Five years, no one saw it. The only people that saw it were the people at Google and those are the people that have millions and millions of dollars to invest in you know, two people or three people or whatever the team was that, that found this bug and created the report. Um, so, so maybe it just doesn't matter. Like maybe we don't deserve working software because it's just too expensive to build. And why is it expensive? Well, it's expensive because like Working software, given complex re requirements, is expensive, right? Like, there's a lot of things that are going on. Like, just look at the networking stack in the blog post that I wrote, or, or look at like this threading bug that I just described, right? Like, we're talking about like 
some of the like you know some of the, the the people who work on the forefront of computing as you know with regard to the Linux kernel who are unable like like th these are people who are like you know internet famous right like these are people who know everything about computers who forgot about like bugs that they introduced you know a few years ago and I, I mean you know I, th I think that like just goes to show that like this 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 thing of cognitive load doesn't just affect you know regular programmers like us like it affects like people who we view as like luminaries or people who we view as like leaders in the field right like if if like the expert on x86 who maintains that code for linux forgets about a thing that was added to you know to fix a bug like a few years prior that then breaks threading like i think that that's pretty clear that like computers are complex even for the smartest people amongst amongst us um, and you know luckily most of those people are are paid um, by their employer to work on open source software but um, I think that there's like something of like a tragedy to the commons going on to some extent where we have lots and lots of people using open source software like Linux or you know apt or yum or like any infrastructure tools and like very few people actually contribute back to the development of those tools and invest back in them to make them better. Um, which sort of brings me to like my closing question that I think like we should all meditate on a little bit is you know you're, you're using your operating system um, like Ubuntu or, 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 or Debian or CentOS or whatever and um, it's built upon the work of, you know, potentially thousands of volunteers. Um, can we really expect those volunteers to be writing, like, working bug-free software for us for free? I would posit no. Um, and, you know, there's lots of examples of, like, interesting things that have come up because of this. Like, you can look at, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the story that happened with the, the maintainer of GPG, but it had come out a few years ago that the maintainer of GPG was, like, going bankrupt and, you know, he, like, didn't have any money to survive or whatever. And this is the guy who's working on GPG, right? GPG is really, really important. Like, lots of important software systems are built on top of GPG. Tons of companies have built, like, billion-dollar businesses because of the software that, that this person wrote. And this person's not even able to work on their software anymore. Like, they're going bankrupt. Like, to me, that doesn't make any sense. Um, you can look at the funding of things like OpenSSL. Um, you know, just recently, people have started donating money, um, you know, big companies started donating money to OpenSSL. Like, how much economic value has been generated off of, you know, the backs of volunteers who work on OpenSSL for free? Um, you can look at a software project like Apt, um, you know, arguably one of the most important software projects for anyone running Ubuntu or Debian. Um, it's maintained, um, you know, the last time I checked, and it could be different now, but the last time I checked, it was maintained by uh, a student volunteer somewhere in Europe. Um, I think that that's bizarre, um, and I don't, I don't think it's right. Um, so I don't know, I just think like my, my, my closing thought for you all today, um, you know, infrastructure as code might be literally impossible, um, but I think that we should sort of meditate on like what our, what our individual roles as people and as companies are in like, you know, in the communities that, that, that you know, that we're sort of taking advantage of and, and whether or not like we should be we should be investing more time, money, and energy into supporting people who work on these tools. So that's it. Um, hopefully you enjoyed my talk. And um, you know if you have any questions, I don't know if we have time for questions. If not, you can feel free to to jump on me after, and I'll be happy to talk to you about you know threading models, register sets, whatever you want. So anyway, thanks for listening. All right, are there any questions? All right, I'm gonna run the microphone back to you so that people on the live stream can actually hear the question. You asserted at the beginning of your talk that there's a heck of a lot of stuff to know and as, as a sysadmin, and you're absolutely right, but you also implied that it's hard to become a good sysadmin, which is wrong because we have new people entering the field every day. So yeah, there's a learning curve, but I don't think it's impossible. Um, so I, I would disagree with that. So do I need to repeat the question or is that on? Okay. So I, I would disagree with that and the reason why I would disagree with that is because um, um, sort of like, I don't know if you saw the talk that I, that I gave last year at all, but um, this talk is sort of building on sort of a lot of the material that was presented last year, wherein that a lot of tools have learning curves with you, but the problem is that um, a lot of people don't understand the actual intricacies of how those tools actually work. Um, and I, I think that like you can find lots and lots of examples, sort of like the example that I gave about the, the syscatl thing, that you could say that, oh, there's a learning curve to configuring your, your server, you need to like set these syscatls, but how many people that are, you know, that are actually out there setting these syscatls actually know what they mean? Um, probably not many, and I think that that's also true for people who are using um, any infrastructure tool like apt, uh, like yum, um, like SSL, like GPG, like 
generally speaking, yeah, there's a learning curve, but I think that that learning curve is basically people like Googling the answer or whatever and copying and pasting like a GPG command off the internet. And I don't, I don't know that that's really like a true understanding of how the tools work and like what their implications are and sort of what the side effects are of using them. So I, I don't know, perhaps we, we, we just disagree on that, I don't know. Got time for one more, and if not, that's cool too. So, all right, thanks, Joe. All right, thanks. Bye.